data and sometimes estimate a value. So as you can see here on the right, we have a very basic neural network whose job it is is to classify images of dogs and cats. So if we feed this network an image of a dog, it performs some matrix algebra and out we get a classification, in this case a dog. So why do we call them neural networks? Well, we call them neural networks because they function a lot like the human brain in that uh, the network takes in information into this sort of input layer that's kind of like machine perception, and we call each one of these purple dots that you see here a neuron. And just like in the human brain, each neuron is connected to every other neuron that fires with different strengths. So, I'd like to ask you all, um, have you ever used a neural network before? And you might think the answer is no, right? But the, actually, you probably already used one, but you are not aware of it. And the most common example is here. Okay, Google. Okay, Google. <laughs> oh no. Wait, it'll get there. Okay, Google. What's in my calendar for today? It worked before the presentation. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> but it was supposed to say, what's on your calendar for today? Um, you have to give a tap talk at New Maine. So every time you say, okay Google, or hey Siri, what's the weather like in Toronto, or translate this for me, you're using a neural network to get this answer. And they can do a lot more than just tell you what's on your calendar for the next couple of days. Uh, one of the most common uses of neural networks is in text recognition, prediction, and translation, and these use a kind of neural network that we call a recurrent neural network and we can use them to create a predictive keyboard, which might be able to predict the next word you will type in to the keyboard. So take for instance, you were to type in, honey, where is my blank? The uh, neural network might suggest a few options, like, honey, where is my super suit, keys, or jacket? And this kind of uh, neural network is actually what is used in the Google Assistant and the personal assistants we see today. So the next example of where neural networks are used are in image recognition and classification in computer vision. And for this we use a convolutional neural network, which is able to take in an image, like you see this one on the right, and identify that there is in fact a horse, a dog, a man, a car, and a, I guess that is another man back there, right? <laughs> um, so yeah. We also use deep neural networks to predict values, like I said, such as how the stock market might be tomorrow, or um, what the price of a home in Arlington will be given the uh, area. This is done using what we call a multi-layer perceptron. That is a general purpose sort of neural network that can be used for a lot of things. Um, it's really good for classifiers, like we saw in that cat and dog classifier that we saw earlier in the presentation. And it can also let us play games with these classifiers, like is this a dog or fried chicken? <laughs> so, um, the final latest addition to the uh, neural network sets are the generative adversarial neural networks, which I said before, specialize in creating new data based on the ones we fed it. And they're used to create those hyper-realistic photos of those people, as well as new Pokemon. If you are a Pokemon fan, uh, someone trained a generative adversarial neural network using the original 150 as input and produced these Pokemon that you see here. Okay, so at this point it's important to realize that neural networks do not come smart. We have to teach them what we want them to do. And we do this through a process that we call training. And this is a process by which we give the neural network hundreds if not thousands of examples of what we want it to do and let it make mistakes so that it can learn to produce the correct result. A lot like a human being learns by um, example, or by uh, error, producing errors. Uh, so let's say that we wanted to create that neural network that was a cat and dog classifier that we saw earlier. The first step is to give uh, or collect a labeled data set. So a labeled data set is a data set that contains information um, based on the classifications of the images in there. So for us, we would use a bunch of images of cats and label them all cat. 
and a bunch of images of dogs and label them all dogs. And this lets the neural network know whether or not it's made the right decision once the classification has been done. Um, the image is then broken up in terms of its pixels and put into this long string that we see here. This string is then fed into the input layer of the neural network where it performs some matrix algebra, that neuron firing thing, and gives us a classification. Uh, sometimes the wrong classification. So we fed it a dog and it's kind of labeled it as a cat. So this is obviously wrong. But this is where the learning actually happens. And it happens specifically in these webs of lines that we see here. After the wrong classification has been done, and after all that matrix algebra has been um, performed. So why specifically in these lines, or these web of lines? And this is because each web actually represents a set of numbers that corresponds to the firing strengths of the neurons. So effectively, if we change these sets of numbers, oh, and these numbers are solely responsible for determining the decision that the neural network makes. So, if we are to change these numbers, then we effectively change the outcome of the neural network, uh, the classification. So, every time that our network makes a wrong classification, a signal is sent back to these webs to change these values in such a way that it will lead us towards a correct answer. So, as you can see here, we've changed these values, these numbers here, corresponding to firing strengths, to these, and that has now let the neural network make the correct classification of the image we fed it, which is a dog. Um, so when we talk about machine learning, this is what we're talking about. We take a neural network and these numbers that correspond to the firing strengths are changed until we can make the correct classification up to 90% of the time or better. And once that's done, we can consider the network trained and that's where all of the magic actually happens. Uh, no pun intended, Harry Potter. So this is a recurrent neural network that was trained on Harry Potter novels and told to create a uh, story for itself. Yeah. And the results are actually pretty funny, as probably some of you have read. Um, so this paragraph here on the right was completely created by artificial intelligence. And my favorite line is this one here, boxed in red. It says, Harry looked around and then fell down the spiral staircase for the rest of the summer. <laughs> uh, my second favorite line is here, which says, the floor of the castle seemed like a large pile of magic. So you can see that it's producing some appropriately themed text, but it's sort of nonsensical still. Um, so I just thought this was an amusing use case of neural networks, and if you'd like to see more of this Harry Potter network generated text, then you can simply Google Harry Potter neural networks, and you will see a few more pages of um, what was created. Okay, so yet another way that networks, neural networks, have um, done some amazing things is in the medical field. So there was a study published in the Annals of Oncology that used a convolutional neural network to correctly diagnose patients with melanoma up to 10% better than trained medical experts. So I thought that was actually pretty impressive, and it shows that neural networks can be used to make improvements elsewhere in the medical field and probably beyond. So you can take, for example, maybe transportation or somewhere else in the public sector. So what if you could get a ride from a self-driving car? Uh, neural networks are actually making this possible, and they're well on their way to becoming a reality. There is a company called Waymo that has a fleet of self-driving cars that use an array of neural networks to power them. Um, so these cars use a, the sensors around the periphery of the vehicle as input to these specialized neural networks, which um, uh, include this path net, which highlights the drivable path ahead of the vehicle. So you can see here, uh, the road is highlighted in yellow. There is a dedicated drive net that perceives other cars on the road and pedestrians as well as traffic lights. A light net that classifies the state of the traffic light, whether it's green, yellow, or red. And a weight net, which is probably the most important one in my opinion. Uh, so it detects the conditions under which the vehicle must stop, slow down, or wait, such as if it were to encounter a pedestrian, a, um, a red light, or a stop sign. So along with these, it uses a multitude of other neural networks in order for the car to drive safely. 
And the exciting thing is that they're already on the road in a beta program in a small neighborhood in the Phoenix area. Um, unfortunately, they're not yet ready for public use, but uh, they are coming, and I hope to get a ride from a self-driving car sometime in the future, which would, I'm sure that anyone here would also like that. Um, at the time, or at the current time though, there are human drivers behind the wheel ready to take over in case anything wrong happens. Um, but some of these rides are actually completely driverless, which is pretty cool. Okay, so how many of y'all have seen The Shining? Got Great, okay, so you're gonna like this one. Um, so this is the last use case of neural networks that I'm going to be showing you tonight. Um, they are called deep fakes. And this is where we use a type of neural network called an autoencoder and decoder set that is able to place one person's face on another person's body and even mimic their facial expressions when we don't have data of them making expressions. So anyone who has seen The Shining will know that it was originally starring um, Jack Nicholson, as you can see here at the bottom, and Jim Carrey had nothing to do with this movie whatsoever. Uh, at the time the movie was shot, in 1980, uh, Jim Carrey would have been 18. Uh, far too young to play one around this guy's age. Um, but, with the help of neural networks, we can turn The Shining starring Jack Nicholson into The Shining starring Jim Carrey, with incredible detail. The keyboard, and he's typing on the keyboard always gets me. <laughs> and if you didn't watch this movie before, it's almost hard to tell that this was not the original person cast, right? So, at this point, you're probably wondering, well, how does someone even create something like this, right? And the answer is in two steps. Uh, the first step is we use computer vision to identify the faces in the video frames as well as the images that we feed the network. And the second step is to use that autoencoder and decoder set that I was talking about earlier to compress the images of the faces down to a very basic representation and get them ready to be mapped onto the other person's face. So here is that autoencoder and decoder set that I was talking about earlier, um, and the neural networks are actually here in the boxes of red and blue. So it is this encoder's job to take this image of Jim Carrey and compress it down to a very base form that we call a latent image or a latent face. It is then the decoder's job to try and reconstruct the original image given the latent face that we've given it. After a few thousand tries, the decoder is able to learn how to reliably reconstruct images of Jim Carrey, and in effect, we have a decoder that specializes in making Jim Carrey's face based on these latent images. So, we then do the same exact thing, but for Jack Nicholson's face, we create that encoder and decoder pair, but instead of using a different encoder, we use the same encoder that we use for Jim Carrey, and this is so that when we compress down the space of Jack Nicholson, it is um, contained in the same format that this latent face was. Now this is where the interesting part happens. So the face swap. So if we were to then take this image of Jack Nicholson and compress it down using this encoder to um, give us that bare image, that basic image, and feed it to the network that specializes in reconstructing Jim Carrey's face, then we get this piece of witchcraft that we see here. <laughs> Um, and if we do this over and over again for every frame in the video and collect them all together, then we get that deep fake we saw earlier. That is the shining starring <laughs> Jim Carrey. <laughs> so, as you've already seen or I've shown you tonight that neural networks actually have the large capacity to change the world around us, um, whether it be in the entertainment industry, the medical field, or through self-driving cars. And I'd like to close out with a quote from someone very prevalent in the field of machine learning. And he says that just as electricity transformed almost everything 100 years ago, today I actually have a hard time thinking of an industry that I don't think AI will transform in the next several years. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for letting me join your network tonight. And
I hope I'm showing you uh, the right feature that AI has. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, questions? We have one way up here. Do you mind yelling? Sure. Oh. So there are some people who have like sort of ideas of how to deconstruct what the actual machine is like looking for, you know, certain features of things like that. Um, I don't know a whole lot about, oh, and people use convolutional neural networks for that. But I honestly, I do not know a whole lot about like the state of um, deconstructing how the actual machine is um, identifying parts of the image. Okay, my concern is political implications. Sure. You know, there's somebody, they're doing something, it's bigoted, it's embarrassing, whatever, and you put another candidate's yes. face on it. Yes. That concerns me. It's a valid concern, honestly. And um, so I think that. Well, it's a tough question that politicians are going to have to try and figure out like how to regulate this sort of technology coming in the coming future but I think maybe um, artificial neural networks might actually be the answer as well to detecting these deep fakes um, yeah as well as sort of um, giving people who learn about this technology classes in ethics like journalists do to try and not regret what they create yeah, so that's that's, uh, that's what I have to say about that. So, so at what point do you like? At what point do you stop training the network? Is there like a way to quantify how like what's good enough to use? Yes. Okay. So that is um, a little bit of a deeper question. I can ask answer that question afterwards, but it has to do with overfitting. So basically, like say, it's kind of like people how people learn, right? So. Um, after a certain part in training, the network starts to memorize what you've been giving it, and it doesn't learn to um, like identify things it has never seen before, and that's called overtraining or overfit. Yeah. So you can plot a, you can make a plot that'll tell you like, oh, I should stop training here. So. Uh... Kind of in the realm of like the political aspect, sure. there was recently I've been watching this YouTube premium series called The Age of AI. And okay. there was a portion of it where it talked about neural networks creating fake faces and recreating faces uh, from people like who have been deceased. And we see that in like current movies like Star Wars, for example, where they recreated um, Carrie, Carrie Fisher, Fisher and that other general's name I can't remember. Um, but there was another example that they provided that they were, I believe it was James Dean that they were talking about. They would like recreate his entire face, and that yeah. raises some like ethical, moral concerns. So I guess one of my what I'm asking is like, this, how far can we go with this like AI neural network stuff before we reach like a breaking point? So I think that um, because there are some, this is just a certain. How can I say this? This is just one use case of the neural networks, right? And there's a lot of other good that neural networks can do, um, not just sort of, you know, produce these deep fakes like they do, but um, your question was, how far can we take them until... Until it like, becomes like beyond what we can accept as ethically or morally right. I see. Well, that, I guess, would have to become a legal battle you know, between the people who own that person's likeness, um, whether they're deceased or not. Um, but yeah, I think that's stepping more into the realm of like legal issues. Um, the best that people can do, like I said, would be to teach people who are learning about this kind of technology um, how to handle it appropriately and ethically. And I think that starts with um, giving people courses in ethics like journalists do. Um, Oh, yeah, go for it. So, let's say you're a really sadistic person. And say that you feed the AI a 
picture of the cat, but you've been telling him it was a dog. <laughs> yes. Does it ever does it ever know to self-correct us up saying that, wait a minute, I've been doing some research and saying, wait, you're feeding me a lie. This is actually a cat, not a dog. Does it or is it simply just garbage in, garbage out? Well, it's it's more dependent on um, that label data set that I was talking about, right? So let's say that we were to take those images and instead of um, the images of cats and instead label them dog, right? Um, it would not know any better. It's just like if you were to raise a child to identify a dog as a cat, it's just like, oh no, that's always a cat, you know? Um, it's not able to grab any outside information to sort of read or reason for itself that this is not right. Um, it's entirely dependent on what we can say. I think someone has the mic. Yeah, so I just want to make a point. I, I'm, I'm retired now, but I come from the cybersecurity field. There's going to be a whole other industry of digital forensics that's going to come up. That detectives out there that will be able to, because you know, all of this technology is going to leave some sort of digital footprint. Yeah. They will look for to prove whether it's something that's produced, you know, that it's the real thing or that it's, that it's been, you know, uh, manipulated. So, you know, a whole other industry for some of the young people out here. Comment? So three, this one. This one. <laughs> hey, Juan. Hey, what's up? How do you play rock and in your art field? Okay, so um, as I said, I do physics, right? And um, in my field, I use neural networks to try and we use them as classifiers. You know, to try and identify certain types of physics objects um, from another kind of physics object. And right now, the methods that we have um, don't do a good enough job at separating the two. And we hope that using neural networks will improve that. Question over here. Okay. So for the audio encoder, it looks like basically a compression algorithm. Could you use it as a lossy compression algorithm replacement, or is it not adaptive enough for like music, video, things like that? So I heard that Google is actually looking into using this as a file compressor, right? Uh, so it definitely has that use case where we can sort of compress a high quality image down into a very basic form, transfer it over a network so it's faster, and reconstruct it maybe on your phone. What, uh, what would be like the theoretical ratio of compression that you're looking at though? I'm not sure how lossy it is actually, but um, if you start off with a fairly high quality object, the loss should be enough so that it's a good enough resolution. Are we, are we talking orders of magnitude higher than what our current like you know, degree? And oh, as like a just a sure replacement? Actually, I'm not sure about that. Like what the technical details of that are. Not that storage is a concern. <laughs> yeah. All right. If we can all thank Juan Cardenas again. Get the free keychains and stickers. A um, couple other things. So I'm just.